The Outermost House, A Year of Life on the Great Beach of Cape Cod by Henry Beston Chapter 2 Autumn, Ocean and Birds There is a new sound on the beach and a greater sound. Slowly and day by day the surf grows heavier and down the long miles of the beach at the lonely stations men hear the coming winter in the roar. Mornings and evenings grow cold. The northwest wind grows cold. The last crescent of the month's moon, discovered by chance in a pale morning sky, stands north of the sun. Autumn ripens faster on the beach than on the marshes and the dunes. Westward and landward, there is color. Seaward, bright space and austerity. Lifted to the sky, the dying grasses on the dune top's rim tremble and lean seaward in the wind. Wraiths of sand cores flat along the beach. The hiss of sand mingles its thin stridency with the new thunder of the sea. I have been spending my afternoons gathering driftwood and observing birds. The skies being clear, noonday suns take something of the bite out of the wind, and now and then a warmish west-south-westerly finds its way back into the world. Into the bright, vast days I go, shouldering home my sticks and broken boards and driving shorebirds on ahead of me, putting up sandlings and sandpipers, ringnecks and knots, plovers and killdeer, coveys of a dozen, little flocks, great flocks, compact assemblies with a regimented air. For a fortnight past, October 9th to October 23rd, an enormous population of the migrants has been stopping over on my East Ham sands, gathering, resting, feeding, and commingling. They come, they go, they melt away, they gather again. For actual miles, the intricate and inter-criss-cross pattern of their feet runs unbroken along the tide rim of Cape Cod. Yet, it is no confused and careless horde through which I go, but an army. Some spirit of discipline and unity has passed over these countless little brains, waking in each flock a conscious sense of its collective self and giving each bird a sense of himself as a member of some migrant company. Lone flyers are rare, and when seen have an air of being in pursuit of some flock which has overlooked them and gone on. Swift as the wind they fly, speeding along the breakers with the directness of a runner down a course, and I read fear in their speed. Sometimes I see them find their own and settle down beside them half a mile ahead. Sometimes they melt away into a vista of surf and sky, still speeding on, still seeking. The general multitude, it would seem, consists of birds who have spent the summer somewhere on the outer cape and of autumn reinforcements from the north. I see the flocks best when they are feeding on the edge of a tide which rises to its flood in the later afternoon. No summer blur of breaker mist or glassiness of heat now obscures these outer distances and as on I stride, keeping to the lower beach when returning with a load. I can see birds and more birds and ever more birds ahead. Every last advance of a dissolved breaker, causing on, flat and seething, has those who run away before it, turning its flank or fluttering up when too closely pursued. Every retreating in such slide as those who follow it back, eagerly dipping and gleaning. Having fed, the birds fly up 
to the upper beach and sit there for hours in the luke cold wind flock by flock assembly by assembly the ocean thunders pale wisps and windy tatters of wintry cloud sail over the dunes and the sandpipers stand on one leg and dream their heads tousled deep into their feathers i wonder where these thousands spend the night waking the other morning just before sunrise i hurried into my clothes and went down to the beach north and then south i strolled along an ebbing tide and north and south the great beach was as empty of bird life as the sky far to the south i remember now a frightened pair of semi palmated sandpipers did rise from somewhere on the upper beach and fly toward me swift and voiceless pass me on the flank and settle by the water's edge a hundred yards or so behind they instantly began to run about and feed and as i watched them an orange sun floated up over the horizon with the speed and solemnity of an olympian olympian balloon the tide being high these days, late in the afternoon, the birds begin to muster on the beach about ten o'clock in the morning. Some fly over from the salt meadows, some arrive flying along the beach, some drop from the sky. I startled up a first group on turning from the upper beach to the lower. I walk directly at the birds. A general appreciation, a rally, a scutter ahead, and the birds are gone. Standing on the beach, fresh claw marks at my feet, I watched the lovely sight of the group instantly turned into a constellation of birds, into a fugitive Pleiades, whose living stars keep their chance positions. I watched the spiraling flight the momentary tilts of the white bellies, the alternate shows of the clustered grayish black backs. The group next ahead, though wary from the first, continues feeding. I draw nearer. A few run ahead as if to escape me afoot. Others stop and prepare to fly. Nearer still, the birds can stand no more. Another rally another scutter and they are following their kin along the surges no aspect of nature on this beach is more mysterious to me than the flights of these shorebird constellations the constellation forms as i have hinted in an instant of time and in that same instant develops its own will birds which have been feeding yards away from each other each one individually busy for his individual body's sake, suddenly fuse into this new volition and flying, rise as one, coast as one, tilt their dozen bodies as one, and as one wheel off on the course which the new group will has determined. There is no such thing, I may add, as a lead bird or guide. Had I more space, I should like nothing better than to discuss this new will and its instant or origin. But I do not want to crowd this part of my chapter, and must therefore leave the problem to all those study the psychic relations between the individual and the surrounding many. My special interest is rather the instant and synchronous obedience of each speeding body to the new volition by what means by what methods of communication that this will so suffuse the living constellation that its dozen or more tiny brains know it and obey it in such an instancy of time are we to believe that these birds all of them are machina as Descartes long ago insisted, 
mere mechanisms of flesh and bone so exquisitely alike that each cogwheel brain encountering the same environmental forces synchronously lets slip the same mechanic ratchet or is there some psychic relation between these creatures does some current flow through them and between them as they fly schools of fish i'm told make similar mass changes of direction i saw such a thing once but of that more anon. We need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in civilization surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err, and greatly err. For the animal shall not be measured by man in a world older and more complete than ours. They move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained. Living by voices, we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. The afternoon sun sinks red as fire. The tide climbs the beach. Its foam a strange crimson. Miles out, a freighter goes north, emerging from the shoals.